So, I want to begin by sharing a, a, a thing I, I read somewhere of a certain police commander who was training certain rookie officers how to engage with criminals in, in the battlefield. And so, uh, he put uh, a mannequin uh, aside and then he put what we call a bulletproof vest on that mannequin and he said so this is a bullet and a bullet can kill but when you have a bulletproof vest it prevents those bullets from getting into your body so he cocked his uh, his machine gun and he fired shots at that mannequin and then he removed the money the, the bulletproof from the mannequin and then he asked the people who are looking at him and asked him can you see any bullet holes on this mannequin and all of them clapped in amazement and said, eh, this thing works. And they were all excited, feeling a sense of security. But then he lifted it up and said, now I need a real life volunteer to come and put on this bullet vest and I'm going to fire rounds on you so that we can see if it really works. And the place went quiet. And you see, indeed, like you, if I was in that place, I would not have volunteered to wear that bulletproof vest. Because the truth is, at the bottom of our minds, skepticism lies. Skepticism and doubt lingers beneath the surface. And it only arises when, it is, when we are confronted to act upon our purported beliefs. So today I want to question us. I want to engage with us because sometimes many of us confess salvation. We, we say we believe, but when you're really put to the corner and hard questions are asked or you experience crisis in your life that poses questions about your faith, then that's the point where our doubts begin to rise. And this is what happens with the issue of salvation. People have skepticism and doubts about salvation and it only arises, like I said, when we have been questioned. So today I want to share some of the doubts that we have about salvation. Some of the reasons we doubt salvation. And if it really works and if it is indeed true. And if you're here and some of these reasons are true to you, I pray that the Holy Spirit would engage you today so that you can move from doubt to faith like Nathaniel. Because there are people who believe that salvation doesn't seem to work. If, and I say this because they look at people who are saved and they are saying, if it does not work for them, how will it work for me? They are looking at born again people and they are saying, some of them are still sick, some of them are still broke, drowning in debt, and they even struggle with sin and addictions. So why would I believe that this thing actually works? What's the use? Other guys believe. That salvation does not work because they have seen people that were branded as strong icons in the faith. And then when they fell short and they fell into a certain temptation, they start asking, what's the use? Look, if such a man can fall, then what's the use of salvation? It's neither here, neither there. Some believe salvation is hard work and they don't have what it takes to put in all that work. That's why many just say, I don't think I am willing to get saved because I don't think I'll be genuine because I doubt my ability to put in the work. And that is based on the belief that salvation is based on our works. Some just believe that salvation doesn't make logical sense and faith is an easy way of escaping or justifying things we cannot prove. So when somebody asks you, do you believe? You say, I have faith. Then explain your faith and you say, I just have faith. And the world likes laughing at us because we look dumb. And indeed the Bible says that salvation is foolishness to those that are perishing. Amen. Some believe salvation is an easy escape for hopeless and lazy people who just love to pray. And who believe that prayer is the answer to everything. And while there's a, there's a slim truth to that statement, when stretched beyond it, it becomes a lie that hinders people from getting saved. Some believe that salvation is for special people who have a super power for avoiding the desires of the flesh. You know, some of you look born again, even without being born again. There are just some people here who look holy without being necessarily holy. Your face just looks holy, right? <laughs> you seem like you have the superpower for avoiding all the niceties of this world. You just look like a nice guy. But let me tell you, salvation is not for nice guys because all of us have sinned. Even the most holy people who look holy have sinned and 
fall short of the glory of God. Some here probably are struggling. Yes, you've come to church, but there's a lacing of skepticism. There's a, a sniff of doubt. There's a scent of doubt because you believe salvation is a hoax because it is all about the money. Look at all the pastors on TV. Look about, look, listen to what they say. Listen to what they demand of the faithful. And you'll realize at the end of it all, this is all business. And so you tend to judge the church from that perspective. And every word that the church says or professes is judged on that basis. Some of us have what I call a personalized individual faith. When you're questioned, you say, ah, I have my own thing with Jehovah. Me and God, we have a special affair. I know the Bible says Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, but me, kuna venye na juana na God. And please, usini because you look at my life, surely. God is with me. Look. Then there are just others who believe everything to be true about the gospel, but it's not for today. So we say, I will get born again one day, but not today. So how do we begin to celebrate life? I believe we need to begin from the place of understanding what eternal life really is. That's why my title for today is Understand Life in capital letters. Amen. Because you cannot celebrate what you do not understand. Amen. We must first of all understand what eternal life is if we are to receive it, appreciate it, live it in order for us to celebrate it. Amen. And you see, like I said, we will fail to reap the full benefits of eternal life simply because we are skeptical and doubtful of what it means, what it is, and what it does to us. And maybe I've shared some of the reasons that are a reality to you. Maybe some of these things that I've shared are still lingering in your mind. And today when somebody asked you that question, are you born again, probably that doubt rose to the surface. But I want to tell you, you're not alone. And I want to tell you that God is not shy to engage with you. Jesus is not shy to engage with you even when you are doubtful. The Holy Spirit exists to convict and engage with us and prove to us that Jesus is indeed the Son of God. Amen. So come close today. Engage with this message and I hope that you will rise up in faith and, and move from doubt to faith like Nathaniel. You see, Nathaniel was indeed skeptical about Jesus and salvation, especially when Philip came to him. Nathaniel was probably a nice guy. The Bible has told us that he was somewhere under a fig tree. And people say that people used to go to under the fig tree to probably meditate and pray and seek the Lord. So probably when Philip came to him, he found him at a place of expectation and prayer. But then when Philip told him, we have found the Savior, come and see. And he said, from where? And he talked about Nazareth. Now, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And that's when his doubt rose to the surface. So, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nathaniel asked. Let's go there. John 1, 43 and to verse 46. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. And I hope that we as a church will never stop inviting people to get saved. Amen. Because this is a calling. This, we are a world-changing church. Don't be shy. Don't, don't be coy. Don't be silent about what you have. Let your light shine. Speak about it like it's the best thing that ever happened because it is the best thing that has ever happened to us. Amen. So Philip here is bold. He says, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. But it rose. Skepticism arose. Doubt arose. And he said, Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. But Philip dared him and he said, come and see. Amen. You see, Nazareth was not a very good place. It was not one of those places that people talked about with a sense of expectation or pride. You know, it was one of those places that, you know, the lowest of the low used to live. And so there was nothing much that people expected could come out of there. But there's something I love about Jesus. That when Jesus decided to come into the world, 
He did not write on the clouds that behold, 2021, the Son of Man will come. He did not make a big deal of it. There were no lights, camera, and actions, and posters, and billboards on the street. They did not prepare a, a five-star hospital room for him to be born. No, he was the real Odi. Amen. And he associated with the lowest of the low. And this is why many people struggled even in this day to believe that Jesus was the Son of God. And I want to just put some of these questions to you because maybe even in those days they wondered, can salvation come from a man? Amen. Even if it was prophesied, but can salvation come from a man? How can this man claim to be God, yet he's a man like all of us? A son of a carpenter. I saw his dad. I saw him playing kati around here. I saw him doing things as a child. How now will he rise and say that he is a son of God? Doubts. You see Philippians 2, 6, 7, it says Jesus, it talks about Jesus' humility, who being in, in the very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Amen. Maybe that's why they doubted. Maybe some of them asked, can salvation come from a man who has no house, no property, no wealth, no stature, no position? Remember in one of his conversations in John chapter 9 and verse 6, after saying this, uh, this actually this is Matthew 18, uh, no, Matthew 8 and from verse 19 to 20, sorry. Then a teacher of the law came to him and said, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, listen here. Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Can a poor man influence anyone in our day and time? Do people listen to beggars in the street when they preach with dirty clothes? Surely these people struggle. And maybe this is why some people still doubt salvation. Amen. Maybe some of them in his workings as he was doing miracles, for example, the blind man wondered, can a blind man be healed with saliva and dirt? Why didn't Jesus use nice things to heal some people? Why would he spit, bah, take mud and then, you know, some buzzite on your eyes and then tell you, go and wash your eyes? In a, why? Why wouldn't he have just done some grandiose act of miraculous wonders and say, listen, people of Bethlehem, come and behold as I do a great miracle. Today, the blind shall see. Drum rolls, please. <laughs> Jesus sometimes even healed people and he told them, shh, don't tell anyone. I want you to later on read for yourself John 9 and verse 6 of that story. Can any salvation, another one, come from a king who rides on a lowly donkey? Rulers of that day rode on horses that were studded with probably linen and other royal things, but he rode on a donkey. Can a king surely ride? Zechariah 9, 9 says, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, not even a mature one, the fall of a donkey. John 12, 14 explains that indeed Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. Maybe some of us here represent the lowly things of this earth. Amen. And Jesus is saying, I'm ready to ride on your back. Amen. We are not ashamed. Hallelujah. Can salvation come from a man who defied religion? In our day and time, we have seen tear gas on TV. We have seen people manhandled by policemen. You know, because of this anti-corruption drive, you can imagine Jesus in that day was, was a rebel. He rebelled against the religious people of that day. So he was probably roughed up in the streets. Can salvation come from a man that people perceived as reckless, a rebel, a person who would not bend and abide or even obey the law? Can salvation be found in a man who interacted with sinners? Let me read this one, John 4, 9. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? You remember him being asked, Why do you sit around with sinners? Why, why would anything good come out of such a man? Imagine if your pastor was found at night in Koinange Street. 
Yeah, some of you are already laughing. Hallelujah. And when your car passes by, you see me with the Bible there. Maybe some of you would say, ah, my pastor ndi wanangu kanga. Kujipeleka peleka hapo na kifua alafu, kidogo ni maskando. All right? Can eternal life flow from the one who was crucified like a thief? Who claimed to be God and who would not save himself from the cross? Listen to what they say to him in Matthew 27 from verse 41 to 42. Likewise, also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and, he, and we will believe in him. But he died that day on the cross. So the Holy Spirit is aware of your doubts. The Holy Spirit is aware of things that are keeping you from believing and really engaging with eternal life. But Nathaniel believed in Jesus. That's why I'm encouraged that even we, like him, can believe in Jesus. Genuinely, last week I talked about lessons from the burning bush. I believe genuinely you can encounter God for yourself. That the Holy Spirit can be your inner witness to prove to you without any doubt that he is the son of God. Jesus said to him, John, in, first, in John chapter 1 and from verse 47 to 49. Now they have come with Philip. And now he has seen him for himself. And Jesus begins to talk and he says, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathaniel asked him, Where did you get to know me? You see, that's the thing about the Holy Spirit that I've learned in my life. When the Holy Spirit speaks to you, he does not speak like a stranger. He speaks to you because he knows you. The Bible says, I knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. The Holy Spirit knows you more than you know yourself. He knows thoughts about you, things about you you've not even realized about yourself. So when the inner witness speaks to you, he speaks with familiarity. That's why Nathaniel said, how do you know me? Amen. He knows us. Where did you get? But Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. And he realized this is not normal. And at that time, quickly, he said, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Hallelujah. You see, now Nathaniel has moved from being skeptical to being a believer. And some Bible scholars believe that Nathaniel believed this because Nathaniel probably was familiar with Old Testament prophecy. For example, one such in Zechariah chapter 3 and from verse 8. This is what it says, and I, and I hope you understand it. Listen, high priest Joshua. You and your associates seated before you who are men symbolic of things to come. I am going to bring my servant the branch. Now this is a prophecy about the coming Messiah. I'm going to bring the servant who? The branch. So Jesus here is being called the branch. Remember, he was under the fig tree here. All right, let's continue. He says, see the stone I have set in front of Joshua. There are seven eyes and on that one stone I will engrave an inscription on it, says the Lord Almighty. And I will remove the sin of this land in a single day. On that day, each of you will invite your neighbor, like Philip invited him, to sit under your vine from where, from where Nathaniel was and the fig tree and declares the Lord Almighty. So probably he was sitting there and he was connecting these two things, these prophecies, and he said, surely the prophetic word has come to pass. The point is Nathaniel probably believed when he realized that these prophecies were being fulfilled right before his eyes. Right now, probably we have no fig trees, but we have the Holy Spirit. Amen. And you see in John 16 verse 8, he says, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will prove or convict to the world and he will convict them to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. The Holy Spirit convicts you with the words of Romans 3. That even though you feel righteous, even though you've done righteous things, even though you feed the hungry, even though you come to church, even though you sing with your hands raised high, if you've not confessed Jesus in your heart and believed in your heart and confessed him with your mouth, you have not been born again. And he urges you to confess. He urges you to give your life to him. Hallelujah. Blessed are those who believe in Jesus by faith. Yes, that thing that the world calls, calls foolishness, 
You see, in John 1, 50 and verse 51, Jesus then asked him a question. And I want you to take note of this. Jesus said, Nathaniel, you believe because I've told you that I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that, he added. Very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open up and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Remember, this same thing happened to Jacob. When he was sleeping, he saw a ladder and angels descending and ascending. And basically, Jesus is trying to tell him, yes, right now you have believed because I've told you. But your faith will mature beyond this experience and you'll begin to see my wonders and my acts and my miracles. But above all, you will realize that I'm the divine link between heaven and earth. Hallelujah. You will see angels descending and ascending and you'll realize I'm the real fulfillment of scripture that will connect you to heaven. The promise that has been given to you. Amen. But John 20 and verse 29, Jesus says something to us that is relevant to us in this generation. Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Hallelujah. Let me tell you, I do not need to see Jesus. I've never seen him. I've never gone before a burning bush. But I believed it when the Holy Spirit convicted me. And I walked down the aisle. Even though I'd never slept with a girl. Even though I'd never drank beer. I was not one to go to the clubs. But the Holy Spirit reminded me, Brian, you are lost in sin. You are lost in sin. And I went down to the altar. And I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And my life has never been the same again. I may not be the richest man in the block. I may not have influence, but I'm a child of the Most High God. Hallelujah. And that is what can happen to you today. Because you have seen me, you believe. The world likes saying, show me and I will believe. Amen. The world is not one to believe in what you say. That's why I say skepticism lies beneath the surface. And it only arises when we are cautioned and prodded to act upon our purported belief. Today, I dare ask you, do you believe? Amen. Do you believe he's the savior of your life? Do you believe that this Christmas we're celebrating a man who came in loneliness, was not born in a five-star hospital, was not visited by royal people, but yet he was carrying in him heavenly royalty? Do you believe that he invited? That's why I ask you, do we understand life? Do we understand salvation? Because if you don't, you cannot fully celebrate it. I know my time is going short, but let me ask you, genuinely, now let me just come to our old lives in here. How many of you wedding crushers go to weddings of people you don't even know? Just so that you can, you know, take your outfit for a ride. You know, when you go to toy market and you get an outfit, and you hear, there's a wedding, where? Mazena, come. And when you go there and people are being called to dance, you are there with everybody else. Could you, could you, could you, could you? But then you ask your neighbor, at we and And you don't even know these people. And you're the kind of people who live even before the cake, the cake is cut because you have no relationship with this. And I want to dare say, there are some people in the church who are moving around with us, doing everything we do, but they do not know Jesus as their personal savior. Do you know him? Understand eternal. What is eternal life? Quickly, five things. Eternal life is free. Somebody say free. free. We do not earn it. Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in who? In Christ Jesus, our Lord. Hope, church, even if you don't feel like it, let's just give him a big round of applause. Hallelujah. It is for free. Black Friday has gone. Guys, this is, this is a real free gift. Have you unpacked yours? Have you received yours? Eternal life is what? It is Jesus. Somebody shout Jesus. Somebody shout Jesus. John 11 verse 25 says, Jesus said to her, I am the, resu the resurrection and the life. Believing Jesus grants you eternal life. Not anything but someone. Hallelujah. Lift up your hand and say Jesus. Hallelujah. He is eternal life. Number three, eternal life is a present yet eternal state. It is not something we are going to have. It is something we already have. Hallelujah. If you have believed in your heart 
and confessed with your mouth you have it hallelujah stop doubting yourself because of your weakness because you fell here and there you have it live in it thrive in it you see john 3 and verse 36 says whoever believes in the son has eternal life has i want you to underline has it is a present now you're not waiting for that fulfillment you're living in it now hallelujah you may be ordinary just like your savior there is no grandiose thing about your life, but you have it. Amen. There's nothing smelling of royalty about you, but you have it. Hallelujah. As we imitate Christ's humility, and then I like this one, number four, what is eternal life? Eternal life is divine. It is not human. John 6 and verse 63 says, the spirit gives life. The spirit, not your mother, not your pastor, the Holy Spirit gives life. That's why we say you are born again because you cannot go to your mother's womb and come out afresh. But you can go to the spiritual womb of God and come out afresh, come out different, come out brand new because he gives new life. The last one, and I love this one. Eternal life is growing in knowledge of God. John 17 and verse 3. And this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life is ongoing knowledge, ongoing understanding. Do you understand life? Hallelujah. Let's give him a big round of applause. I love this. In conclusion, I want to ask you a question as we close. I know we want proof that the gospel is true. We are living in a very logical world. Some do not believe because they went to Google and they did a desktop review that says salvation is a hoax. That says the Bible is full of, you know, inconsistencies. And because of that, then we cancel everything we know about salvation. Let me tell you, Google will not save you. Amen. So many people saying so many things. Who do you believe? Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit will witness to your heart. So right now I want us to close our eyes. Let's go in prayer and ask, do I understand what I have? And maybe somebody is saying, Pastor, I don't even have that. I, I don't have it. The Holy Spirit is here saying to you, you are lost without me. You are lost without me. But I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's saying, give me your life. Let me save you. Let me give you new birth. If you're here and you've not received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want you to lift up your hand. Like Nathaniel, Jesus is not shy to come to you, to reveal himself to you. Lift up your hands. I want to pray with you. Amen. Anybody in this place? Anybody in this place? Lift up your hand if you're saying, today I want to receive Jesus. I want to confess him with my mouth. And I want him to be my Lord and my Savior. Hallelujah. Anybody here? Before we close the service, I want to begin not to lock you out. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let's stand up. Let's stand up. Let's stand up and worship him. Let's give thanks. Hallelujah. Thank you so much for watching our service. We are so grateful that you decided to join us today. If you were blessed by our sermon, we want to ask that you would consider sharing this message with your friends, your family, your co-workers, anybody that the Lord leads you to share it with. We also would like you to consider supporting our ministry by any donations that the Lord places on your heart to give. Our details are on the screen. Lastly, give us a follow on our social media platforms and join us for our services every Sunday from 10.30 a.m., 11.45, and 1 p.m. respectively. We hope to see you here with us. God bless you. See you soon.